Hello and welcome to this tutorial on internet service providers and the internet. Now these are two common terms, we hear them a lot. The internet is everywhere, everyone's online, but it could be a challenge to really define them and understand them and, and figure out how they fit together. It's really good to know these terms as well if you're working for a service provider or an enterprise purchasing services from a service provider. They come up on the job quite a lot. So we'll start with an ISP, figure out what it is, what it does, some of its characteristics, and then we'll see how the ISP fits into the internet and what that is exactly. Here we have a sample ISP. There are just four customers in this diagram, but in reality, ISPs vary quite a bit. They can be regional, relatively small, to an entire continent, to multi-continent, multinational. So you could have one hundreds to thousands, even tens of thousands of customers. Of course, the types of customers vary as well. It's another point to note about ISPs. They can service Soho clients, they can service enterprise clients, or just even uh, your casual home user. By the way, if you're not yet familiar with Soho networks and enterprise networks, go ahead and take a look at the tutorial we have on those two terms. So. What does an ISP do? Well, it provides internet access, pretty straightforward, and it does this in many different ways. It has many different circuit types and technologies to deliver access to each client. We're not going to get into all the details of the different types of circuits, but we'll just go over a few just so you get an idea of the, the variety that exists. So in this diagram on top at Soho A, we have a cable modem. And over at Soho B, we have a DSL modem. More often than not, those are for home users, Soho networks, although there are business class offerings on those as well. Enterprise B here may use a circuit known as a T1. And Enterprise A may use a circuit known as a T3, which is like a T1, but it has more bandwidth. Some of the other types of technologies and circuits you might have heard about could include frame relay, MPLS, Metro Ethernet, and all these vary slightly in, in, in different ways. Um, some use existing infrastructure to deliver the circuit. Some are provisioned specifically for uh, a connectivity to a particular client. Also, just on, on a very high level, when you're talking different circuits, more often than not, the big thing is you're talking, aside from the different technological differences, is bandwidth. How much data can be pushed across that circuit at any given time. So these circuits are provisioned to clients, and ISPs are located, or have locations, called POPs. They're called points of presence. And what that means is, it's an area, it's an access point for that network. And they use this area, it's a facility with routers and switches and circuits, they use this to connect to other clients. And they use it to connect to ISPs. These are generally located in major cities, but not necessarily. So in this diagram here, we may have one pop here, and this is the New York City pop. You may have a second one here on this ISP's network, and this is for Chicago. Again, just an example, they vary greatly, but a POP is a point of presence and is used as an access point. Good thing to keep in mind. Now, aside from circuits and internet access, ISPs actually do deliver other services. It could be website hosting or hosting a server for you or your company. Cloud services are, are beginning to take off as well. There's also email, DNS, voice solutions. You know, a lot of ISPs are also traditional telecommunications companies. So they straddle the voice world as well. So voice over IP falls into ISP uh, offerings as well. Often you'll hear about networking solutions or managed services by ISPs. And to give you an example of that, let's say here, Enterprise A and B are actually the same company, just two different locations. And employees at each location need to access resources at both locations. So by using the internet service provider, employees could be enabled to safely and securely access resources at each location and also enable all of the employees to communicate with each other, two main goals of an enterprise network. So now we know ISPs provide internet access and they also provide some other services as well. That in a nutshell is your ISP.
But that's not the internet. That's not everything. This one ISP here does not make up the internet. So let's go ahead and take a look at well, exactly how do they fit into the internet. And here, in the upper left corner, ISP A, we'll use this as the network we just looked at. We'll keep it simple and say there are just four clients hanging off of it. Now, the internet stands for interconnected networks. Interconnected networks. So we see a lot of different networks, all of these different ISPs, and they all need to be connected to each other. That, the whole picture, is the internet. So it's a collection of networks. It's a collection of ISPs. And each ISP has a collection of Soho and Enterprise and home users all connected to them. So you can see if all of these client networks are connected to ISPs and all the ISPs are either directly or indirectly connected to all of the other ISPs, well, then you have the Internet. It's all of them together. Billions of devices, billions of people online. So the Internet is not one network. So let's talk a little bit about how they do connect to each other. You can simply look at the diagram and imagine this. Each network has some kind of connection or multiple connections to other networks. These are often referred to as peering points. And that's a way for two ISPs to connect to each other. And that connection enables traffic from both network, from both of their clients, to get to the other network and perhaps beyond that. There are generally two types of peering points. One is a private peering point. So if we were to look at ISP C and ISP E up here, perhaps these are two POPs in the same city, and that green line is a dedicated circuit between the two ISPs. It's only used for their traffic, ISP C and E, and all of their clients. That way, users on each network can get to resources, websites, or whatever on the other network. There's also another way to go about connecting all of these ISPs. And that's known as the Internet Exchange Point. So imagine here in the middle, that's our Internet Exchange Point. And so each ISP can go ahead and provision a circuit or multiple circuits to that exchange point. At the exchange point, they can then, they can then negotiate peering arrangements with the other ISPs. This is just a really efficient way to do things. Because now ISP D, for example, doesn't have to go ahead and provision perhaps five or ten circuits to different ISPs. They can perhaps provision two, two, one or more exchange points, and then establish a peering arrangement with a whole host of other ISPs. Now, speaking of ISPs, they're not all equal. Some are really big, some are medium, some are small. The big ones are often referred to as Tier 1. And what that means is they're so big, they can pretty much connect to any other ISP that they want to. Now, these definitions are a little bit murky because no one's really authoritative over who can claim to be what kind of tier, Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3. And oftentimes, it's more marketing than not. So buyer beware. But as a rule of thumb, Tier 1s are the big ones. And they don't really, really ever have to purchase uh, a peering session with another ISP. They just negotiate it and it's mutually benef beneficial for them. More often than not, Tier 1 sell connectivity to other ISPs because the other ISPs need them more than they need the other ISPs for the most part. So that's a Tier 1, a really big one. A Tier 2 is slightly smaller. They have some peering arrangements where they and another ISP, like C and E, go ahead and exchange traffic over, over a peering point. But they also have to purchase some as well, perhaps from a larger ISP. The large ISPs, by the way, keep in mind, it could be a company like Verizon or AT&T or Level 3. So we're talking really big ones. Finally, the Tier 3 ISPs, they're pretty much smaller than the Tier 2s. And they, for the most part, have to purchase all of their peering arrangements. So they have some extra costs there, but it enables them to connect their clients to the rest of the world. So if we're looking at ISP A, and this is me here, and I'm interested in connecting to some services, a website perhaps, off of ISP H, well, ISP A needs to go ahead and get some connectivity established, right? Otherwise, I'm not going to get anywhere. So ISP A will have a few connections, perhaps, perhaps even to an exchange point. 
And via one or more of those connections, I will then be able to connect to the rest of the world. So that's it. We've zoomed out. We've looked at all of the ISPs, and we see as a whole, they create the Internet. It's not just one network. So to summarize what we've gone over today, an ISP Internet service provider provides your connectivity in a lot of different ways. And keep in mind, more often than not, it's a Soho or enterprise network. Internet, interconnected networks, a lot of networks all connected to each other, either directly or indirectly. There are many ISPs that are part of the Internet, but it's not one network. It's a, it's a combination, a collection of many. POPs are points of presence where ISPs connect to clients and other networks. It's, it's a facilities with a lot of equipment. Peering is how ISPs connect to each other, and there are two types, generally, private and internet exchange points. Finally, we talked a little bit about the different tiers, tier one, two, and three, from largest to smallest, the different sizes and capabilities of internet service providers. And so there you have it, folks. That is the ISP and the internet tutorial. Thanks for watching.